You are listening to the Truth to Live by Podcast, a ministry of Windward Baptist Church. To learn more about our church, you can check out our website at windwardbaptist.org. All right, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 is predicament. The predicament is the, the predicament that we were in. We were dead in trespasses and sins. And then the provision God provided for us, God who is rich in mercy, He provided salvation. And then now we are positionally sanctified. The position, our position in Christ. So now we'll look at the past. We'll look at Jesus who is our peace. And we'll look at the fact that we have a private citizenship. We are citizens of heaven. So we have verses 11 through 22. So that's about five minutes each point, right? And then we will go home and cook rice. So we know that the last verse we looked looked at, verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We are his masterpiece. We are his workmanship which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them, that we should walk in the good works. So the question is, are we doing good works? What kind of good works have you done this week for Jesus? Anybody want to share some good works that they have done? Praying for people every day. Wow, what a, that's good work. Amen. Appreciate that. That's a good one. Junior, you had one? You you had one? No? Roxanne? Texting words of encouragement. That's a good work. What a blessing. Yes, texting encouraging words. How many of you ever text before? Helping around the house. What a blessing. That's a good work. Your mom is watching this right now. She's watching online. So she knows that her daughter, Jasmine, Jazz Jocelyn, that's what I meant, Jocelyn, is wanting to do more good works and helping around the house. That's a good work. So we were created, the Bible says, to do good work. And those are some good works. Any, any other good works? Any other good works you want to share? Taking care of the animals. You want to sit up and you say that? Sit up so I can hear it better. There we go. Taking care of the animals, right? That's a good work. Yes. You see? Now, we are created to do good works, right? So we should be doing these good works. Working in vacation Bible school would be a good work. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to be Daniel, right? Do I get to be Daniel? Yes. I was Nebuchadnezzar last time? Or maybe I'll be Nebuchadnezzar. I'll be the bad guy. So that's a good work for me to do, right? I can do that because I'm a professional actor. A lot of people, my, my, you know, my father used to say, oh, you're only acting. So, so he was, you know, I guess he was saying that I was a good actor, right? One more. Going to vacation Bible school and inviting your friends, right? I think we already took up our five minutes and we didn't even start. But you know what? It's good to... Um, to to think about what it's saying, how it applies, right? That we are, we are created to do the good works, right? Doesn't it say that? We're his work, we're his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So he's created us to do the good works. That's what he created us to do. Can you imagine if you made something? Like let's say you made a... You made a watch, right? You made a watch. You made it to tell time. And then the watch didn't tell time. What is that? A collectible? But who would want to collect a watch that doesn't work? Or never worked? Okay, we can, we can sit up. Or you're going to make me want to lie down. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get tired. Okay, so we're created to do good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Okay, so that's our position in Christ. That's 
this morning's message. So we're not even at this afternoon's message. So, so I told um, my wife, I said, you know what I'm going to try to do? I'm going to try to preach for 20 minutes, you know, because I want to try to just be straight to the point. Because I listen to myself, when I listen to the messages, I'm sometimes trying to tell myself, but I can't hear myself. I'm trying to tell myself, get to the point, get to the point, get to the point. Okay, so, that wasn't a joke, though. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. So we have past, peace, and private citizenship. Those are our three points. So verse 11 through 13, it says, verse 11, wherefore, you know when the Bible says wherefore, you got to ask yourself, why is the wherefore there? The wherefore is there because of the verse before. And the verse before says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And because we're walking in these good works, and then it continues on. Remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands. He said, you are called to do good works, but remember what, ha- what, what happened to you in the past. I mean, remember where God brought you from. So wherefore is there saying, hey, remember what the Lord brought you from. See, if we remember where we were, just imagine if you were in prison and someone bailed you out. And they bailed you out and they spent a lot of money to get you out of jail. And then they told you, okay, I got you out of jail. Can you wash my car? Oh, I don't want to wash your car. It's like, well, remember, I'm the one brought you. Where would you be if, if I didn't bail you out? I would be in jail. Did you like being in jail? No. Remember all the promises you made? Uh, kind of. Well, you know, so he's saying here, remember that you were lost. You were dead in trespasses and sins. Look where you are now. Shouldn't that make you want to serve the Lord? Sometimes we got to remember what the Lord brought us from. Sometimes we got to remember that we were lost. We had no hope. Remember when you didn't know you were on your way to heaven? Remember when you was confused? Remember when you were in bondage? Remember when you were in jail? Remember when you had difficulties? Whatever the case is, whatever's happened in the past, that should motivate us to live for Him in the future. So that's why He brings this up. Wherefore, remember that ye, being in time past Gentiles, Remember the Gentiles, when you, if you were a Gentile, you, you, didn't, you didn't have the word of God. You didn't have the truth. That ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands. Those that were Jews were called the circumcision, because they were circumcised. And that was the sign, the seal, the symbol of the covenant, right? So those that were, the Gentiles were called uncircumcision. Sometimes they just referred to them that way. In the Bible, when you see that, for the most part, and it depends on the context, but when it says the circumcision, it's talking about Gentiles. When it says, I mean, uh, when it's talking about circumcision, it's talking about Jews. When it says uncircumcision, it's talking about Gentiles. He says, remember, you were Gentiles. You were the uncircumcised. By that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands that at that time you were without Christ. You didn't have Jesus in your life. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Now, it's not talking about an, a Martian or an alien like how sometimes we think of aliens. It's talking about someone who was a foreigner, someone who was not part of God's family. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Hope is a very important thing, just to have hope. They did a, a test on um, frogs or toads, I think. Toad or frog. And so they would, um, they got, no, I think it was mice. And what they did was they had the mice they put the, the mice in a bucket, and they, had, and they had them just tread water. 
I'm also tread water, tread water, tread water for like, you know, 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes or whatever. And then it would just, it would get tired and it would drown. It wasn't that long. Then they would take these mice and it would, they would tread water for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And then they would go in there and then they would save the mouse. They would take the mouse out. They would let it eat or whatever. And then they put it back in the bucket. And so then the mouse would tread water. But because the mouse was rescued, it had hope that it was going to get rescued again. So because of that, that hope, first it lasted like 15 minutes before they drowned initially. But after it got saved, they put it back in there. Then the mouse treaded water again, but it believed it was going to be saved. So because it had hope, guess how long it could tread water? Guess how long? Two years. No. (laughs) No. Well, over an hour. Because it had hope, but they never saved them, and then they drowned. But they still had, they still were able to do it for a longer time. No, they didn't drown. (laughs) But the fact that they had hope allowed them to tread water so much longer because of hope. Hope is very important. And if you and I have, being that you and I have Jesus Christ, we have hope, right? As bad as this world is getting, what do we always say? Hey, pretty soon the rapture is going to take place, right? No matter what happens, we're going to be raptured out of here, right? We have hope, no matter how bad it gets. Even if, well, I don't want to get political, but even if somebody gets reelected, the guy who's in there now, we still know that we have hope because Jesus is coming soon, right? In fact, if he does get reelected, that might expedite the, the process. <laughs> Knuckles. Nah. Oh yeah, this is videotaped. No, but anyway. So he says this. We have to perform good works because Jesus saved us. Remember how it was before that happened. Shouldn't that motivate us? Sometimes we gotta remember where he brought us from, right? You know, sometimes, uh, like, I'm a, I'm a first-generation Christian. That means my family wasn't saved, and, and I, I became a Christian. So now my children are second-generation Christians. So the problem with that second-generation Christians may have is they don't remember what it was like to not have the Lord, right? They were brought up in church, right? So it's a little different. I think Roxanne, she was, uh, um, in, a, in, a, in some ways, kind of like, a second generation Christian, but they had gotten saved when she was, what, how old? Nine, nine, ten years old. So she remembers how it was before they were saved, and then she remembers how, how it was after she had gotten saved. But sometimes second generation Christians don't realize that if they were a part of a family that didn't know Jesus Christ, chances are there could have been things happened to them in their life or their family's life that they would have experienced that because their family is a Christian that they won't experience. Like some people, not to get too personal, mention names, but some people don't know what it's like to be in a family where, where the mom and dad is divorced. Now, I knew what that was like, and I didn't like that, the fact that my mom and dad were divorced. The fact that I had to go to another house and stay with my, my uh, stepbrothers who used to tease me and say things, that's no longer your dad now, that's his dad, that's not your dad. You know, stuff like that really hurts you. So there's things that happen that I determine as a, as a Christian. Well, I even determined this before as a Christian, but now that I'm a Christian, of course, there's so many things that protects uh, our family from things that could happen like that, like divorce or certain abuse or certain neglect. But because we're, it doesn't mean we're perfect, but it's different. And so we who are Christian knows, we know what it was like to not be a Christian. And now that we are a Christian, we should be thankful. And that should motivate us to do the good works. So that's why he has this in there. Remember where you came from. Remember what had happened to you. That's why we observe the Lord's Supper. Because Jesus Christ knows we're human. We have a tendency to forget things, right? 
So when, you, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we're reminded of what Jesus did. He died on the cross. We're reminded of who we are. We're reminded to, to the fact, well, we're of the fact that he's coming again. So that's all important, very important for us. He says, remember, as Gentiles, you didn't have Christ. You were lost. You were aliens. You were outside the camp. You were helpless. You were hopeless. You didn't have answers. You didn't know where you came from. You didn't know where you were going. You didn't know the meaning of life. You were depressed. You were addicted. Whatever the case was. I mean, everybody has differences, different experiences. But without Christ, you have no hope. And he says... Having no hope without God in the world. To be in this world without God is a sad thing. I do not know how people live knowing of the fact that they're going to one day die and everything they've ever lived for is going to be gone. And they're just living their life and getting older and getting weaker and getting, and, and, and getting closer to the day where they're one day going to die. They're going to breathe, breathe their last breath. They're going to be on their deathbed, and maybe they have a disease, or maybe they're just really, really old, or maybe they got into an accident, and they're going to be breathing. That's going to happen to all of us, unless we're raptured. So we always can say, well, we're going to be raptured, but we have hope, and that's a blessing. But people that aren't, that aren't Christians, they have no hope, because you know what, sometimes don't... Do sometimes you like look forward to your death, thinking, hey, one day. I remember Mr. Napuanoa. When I went to visit him, I was expecting something different. Because I went to visit him, and Pastor Mark was telling me his condition, and I'm like, he's, you know, it sounded like he was just days away from passing on, passing away. So I said, I need to go and visit him. And I went down there, and I was talking. You thought this guy was going to Disneyland. <laughs> I was talking, he's, hey, hey, you could tell it was weak, but it's, yeah, man, how are you? Hey, how are you doing? I'm, I'm doing good. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing good. I thought he was going to Disneyland. It was just days that he passed away. He, I promise you, he was excited. He wasn't living in defeat. And it was a few, maybe, I think it was a days, maybe, probably not even a whole week from that point that he passed away. Why? He had hope. Hey, if I, was an un- if I was an unbeliever and I just talked to him, I would know, hey, whatever that guy believes, I, I want to believe that. Yeah. He was in the hospital dying and he had peace. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who, are sometimes, who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So the Gentiles, they were afar off. And see, a Gentile, when a Gentile wanted to become, a, when they wanted to be a believer, when they wanted to come near, there's some things that they had to do. For a Gentile to become a Jew, to become a convert to Judaism, there's three things that they had to do. You know what they are? Three things. Little Robert. Bing, ding, 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 ding. Basically, baptism. Bing, ding, 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 ding. Correct from the sound room. They had to bring an offering. They had to bring a, a, a sacrifice, and they had, to, they had to bring an offering and sacrifice it at the temple. So, if someone wanted to, wanted to convert to Judaism, they had to, number one, they had to be circumcised. Of course, we're talking about a male at this point. They had to be circumcised. Then they had to be cleansed in a mikvah, in a ceremonial bath. We'll just say baptized. That's where baptism comes from. So they had to go down into the mikvah. They had to cleanse themselves ceremonially. And then they had to bring an offering and a sacrifice and offer it at the temple. 
Before they did that, they had to go down into the mikvah. So they had to do those three things to convert to Judaism. Then they, who were afar off as a Gentile, would be brought nigh through those things. Right? But look what it says here. But now in Christ Jesus, ye Gentiles, who, who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by what? Not by being circumcision, or be, not by being circumcised, not by being baptized or going down into the mikvah, not by bringing an offering to the temple, but by what? Blood. By the blood of Jesus Christ. So ye Gentiles who are afar off are made nigh. You've become converts. You've become brought, you are brought near, not by those three ceremonial acts, but by the blood of of Jesus Christ. And by the way, the Jews had to come the same way at this point. So ye Gentiles who are afar off are made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So that's the past. Now we see peace. For he is our peace. Now, you can go to court, and the judge could pronounce, he could make the judgment between the, um, the two parties, and he can say, this is the deal. You got to pay this person so much money. You took this money, or you did this, or that. This happens, and, and he, he hits the gavel down on the table, case closed. But that doesn't mean they have peace between each other, right? But then if you have an arbitrator, you have someone who's between the two parties and says, okay, what is your situation? Okay, what is your situation? And he talks to both parties and he has them both, both come to an agreement. That arbitrator, he causes peace between the two parties. And so now the goal of that arbitrator is that they will have peace. So here you have us on one side, God on the other side. There is no peace. We are at enmity with God. We are, we are uh, uh, enemies. And now... Because of what Jesus has done, now we have peace. He is our peace. He doesn't necessarily grant us peace. He becomes our peace. He becomes our arbitrator. He is the, the go-between. He is the mediator. That's why the Bible says there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. So he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Now, you know, for a Gentile, there, were, there was a partition that kept the Gentiles from getting too close to the temple, right? So let's just say, this is the temple. Yeah, let's just say, you had the temple here, right? You had the temple, and then you had the courtyard. Okay, you had all of these boundaries. You had all of these boundaries. If you were a Gentile, okay, if you were a Gentile, you could come to the outer court. You could come so far. And you could not get any closer. And there was a wall where you had the court of the Gentiles that separated the court of the Gentiles from the court of the women. I don't know if it... If it has the court of the women up there, yeah, you have that. Okay, there's a court of the Gentiles, and you see that line there, and it has the court, the women's court. That's where the women could go. So if you're a Gentile, you could not pass that barrier. You see that barrier right there, that wall? You could not pass that. If you did, in fact, there was a sign there, and they had these signs so, so many feet apart supposedly, and they even found someone they were excavating. And the sign said this, to a Gentile, if you pass this area, pass this area only if you want to die or something like that. I forget how it worded it. But in other words, that if a Gentile went too far, the Gentile would be put to death instantly. That's why you remember what Paul was being blamed for? That they were saying that he took that guy with Trumphimus into the he went past the court of the Gentiles, and they were saying that he did that. And if you did something like that, that Gentile would be put to death, and so would Paul. And that's why they were saying 
if you remember when he got arrested and when he went to Jerusalem and they're saying that he brought Gentiles into the temple, that he went past that area. So then there was an area where the Gentiles could go, but they couldn't go past that. Then there was a court of the women. You see that right there where, it's, where it has that court of the women? So the women could go there. But that's it. They couldn't go further. And then you had an area that was the court of the Israelites. That's where the men could go. It's even further. And you say, well, how come the men could go further than the women? That's how it was. (laughs) And then you had one where those that were priests could go. They could go further still, those that were priests. And then there was a, and there was a barriers that separated each one of these. And then the priest, the priest could go in the, in the outer court where the temple was, like if here's the temple, they could go out in this area. And then only those priests that were chosen to serve on that day could go into the holy place, right? And there was also, there was a, a divider from the outer court, from the inner court. And then there was another division where only the high priest could go once a year into the Holy of Holies. So you see how there was all of these uh, partitions? There was all these barriers. So to get close to Jesus, you had the veil, and only the high priest could go into that holy place. So you got the high priest that could go into the Holy of Holies. You got the priests that were serving, that were selected to go into the holy place, and they would be the ones that would go in there to burn the incense and this and that. And they would go into that holy place. And the other priests, they could stay outside. And you have where the, uh, the brazen altar, you have the laver, and you have those areas where the priests could go. And then you have the court of the Israelites. Then you had the courts of the women. Then you had the court of the Gentiles. There was all these barriers that kept you away from approaching the Lord, right? So to have access to God was very difficult, right? You had to have, to have access to the Holy of Holies. That was very difficult. So it says that he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. He obliterated and removed all these partitions. So now we as Christians can boldly approach his throne to find grace to help in time of need. You and I can go into the holy of holies because of the blood of Jesus Christ that covered our sins. And we now have the righteousness of Christ. And we can approach His throne and bring our petitions to Him. That's the privilege that we have. Don't you feel privileged? In fact, I could have made another point. Privileges. You can insert that if you, will, if you want. It says, Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. So now you have a new man. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body, by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. So now you have, can you remember how you have Jew and Gentile, right? We have Jews and you have Gentiles. And now because of the blood of his cross, he now made a new man. What's that new man he made? Anybody knows? The new man? Superman. No. <laughs> Not Superman. The new man, that is a Christian. That is someone who is a member of the church now. What is a new entity? You have now the church. Jew and Gentile in one body. Figuratively speaking, you have a Christian now. So now, oh, you said that. Well, you were correct. So now we don't say, okay, in our church, who's the Jews here? Anybody that's Jews, who's the Gentiles? We don't have that division. Now, you still have ethnically, you still have those that are, that are Jewish, you know, historically or, or ethnically. 
you have those that have, are, have Jewish ancestry. But does that make them any special as far as God is concerned? No. How about those that are Gentiles? We don't say, well, I'm, I'm a Gentile. Are you a Jew? I'm a Gentile. Okay, well, you sit over there, I sit over here. You eat that, I eat it. No, in the church, is there any dietary restrictions? No. No. You couldn't have that in the church, right? In fact, we're going to see in the next chapter, we're going to be introduced to a word. Let's see if I can find it real fast. In, in verse 3 of chapter 3, it says, How that by revelation how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words. A mystery. And then he goes on to say, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is not revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. What's the mystery? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. The mystery. What is the mystery about? The church. Do you hear about the church in the Old Testament? No. It was a mystery. What is a mystery? Is that like, you know, when, when you watch a mystery movie, you're trying to figure out, you know, like if it's a, a murder mystery, who, who's the one who did it? Was it Brother Robert who did it? Was it Brother Peter that did it? Brother Gail? Did Brother Gail do it with the rope in the, you know, in the kitchen? <laughs> it's a mystery. That's not the mystery what it's talking about here. A mystery is a truth that was hidden in the Old Testament, but it's revealed in the New Testament. What is that mystery? That mystery is the church. You don't hear about it in the Old Testament. Why? Because the Jews were supposed to receive the Messiah. But because they didn't receive the Messiah, now they rejected Jesus Christ, and now the Jews are set on the background scene, and then now God works with the church, which is Jew and Gentile in one body. And so the, the, the church is here until when? Until the rapture. Then the church is going to be taken up, and then after that, God is going to shift his focus back on Israel. Okay, so he says, He is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition with us. And now we have privileges, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. He removed all the barriers, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances that said you could only come so far. Only if you're, a, if you're a Gentile, you can only come so far. If you're a woman, you can come so far. If you're an Israelite, you can come so far. If you're a priest, you can only come so far. If you're a priest, you can come on this time when the days that you are chosen, as the priesthood was divided up into uh, uh, 24 different groups. And uh, as we study that, usually around Christmas time, you know, in the different uh, um, uh, sections of priests that got to serve a certain time period, and they, they, they drew a lot in this and that to see who would do what job and this and that. There's all of these rules, all of these restrictions. It has all been removed. There is no restrictions that restricts us or keeps us out of the holy place. And you remember when Jesus died, at, when he was crucified on the cross, the veil of the temple was what? It was rent in two. It was rent. It was opened up. Now we have open access. Having abolished in his flesh, the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man. Now you and I are Christians. And as it says, their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. And the law is engraven on our hearts. We are now Christians. We have open access. We could go to him in prayer anytime, anywhere. You don't have to go to Israel. You don't have to go to Temple Mount. You don't have to pray to, at, at the uh, Western Wall. Uh, the wailing wall. You don't have to do anything like that. You don't have to dress up a certain way or do a certain thing. You can pray anytime, anywhere about anything on your heart to Him. We have the boldness to enter into the holy place anytime we want. And what do we do sometimes? We don't. We don't do it as much as we should. I know I don't. And by that, and that He might reconcile both unto God in one body by one cross. There's one body now. That's the church having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you that were afar off, and to them that were nigh. 
That's both, right? Them that are far off, Gentiles. Them that are nigh, Jew. Now it's all the same. We're in one body, Jew and Gentile, right? As they say in the southern churches, southern Baptist churches, I guess. Somebody say amen. Amen. Yeah. So now we are, we have citizenship. Now I wanted to make, because it's all starting with P, the letter P, right? So private citizenship. Verse 18 through 22, and we're done. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. You know, I know that sometimes we take for granted, but do you realize the importance of what that just said? Because of Jesus Christ, we have access by one spirit unto the Father. Imagine if you wanted to go into, I don't know, you wanted to go into your hotel room because you're real tired, you know, and you got the key, right? You go to the door, you're so tired, and it says, no access. (laughs) Oh, man. No access. But, you know, we have access to God because of Jesus Christ. Now, because of that, therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. We're, we're, no, we're not strangers. We are citizens. And it is very important for us to be a citizen. You know, for Paul to be a Roman citizen, there were certain rights that he had. What was one of the rights that you know probably off the top of your head that someone who was a Roman citizen had a certain right or a privilege? He had a right to trial. You could not just beat someone who had Roman citizenship without a trial. And that's why Paul said, oh, you beat us without a trial. No, and we are Roman citizens. And they, oh, they cringed because they could be in serious, they could, they, they could be guilty of some serious crimes having done that. So there were certain rights that you had as a citizen. You and I that are United States citizens, we have rights too, right? Sometimes you wonder what happened to our rights <laughs> lately. But we have rights as citizens, right? Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners. Now, a foreigner would not have the same rights as a citizen or, or a stranger. He says, but ye are fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth up in holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for inhabitation of God through the Spirit. Now when you build a house, what's the most important part of that house? Foundation. The foundation. Now how we build, we usually, from when I was in construction, you, when you lay the foundation, you got to dig the footing, right? You got to dig the footing, and the footing got to be so deep, you know, and the engineers, they calculate, you know, how, big, how tall the house is and how big and, and how deep the footing has to be. You got to go so far in the original grade and it's got to be so deep when you get there and you got to have cement and steel and you got to have, you got to tie the steel a certain way and the, the steel has to be certain, it has to be a certain thickness and all of this, right? If you don't do the foundation right, man, it doesn't matter how beautiful that house is going to be, it's, it's not going to stand. The foundation has to be right. Now, in those days, they built differently than how we built. So how they built, the foundation, important part of that building, the most important part is the cornerstone. Because you see, the cornerstone, that is what's going to make that building level and straight. So if you think about a stone, you know, it's square like this, right? So that cornerstone, when you put it in, now you have... These walls are straight because they're going to follow that, that stone, right? So, you know, when you're building, when you're laying out for a house, when you, nowadays you put up, they call the batter boards or, or whatever, right? And you put those up. And I remember this building, even if it was a small structure, that you got to make sure that that is a right angle. Because <laughs> if it's like this, it might, it might seem like it's okay there, but the further you go, now it's crooked, right? It's got to be completely, so that's why you have the Pythagorean theorem, right? 
you got to measure so how far this way, how far this way, and how far this way has got to all. But if you have a cornerstone, that cornerstone is going to be a, a right angle. Not only this way, also what? This way. Right? And not only this way, this way. So now if you follow that, everything is going to be straight. So you would set the cornerstone and you would build everything onto that cornerstone. Now we know that the right cornerstone, the only cornerstone that's going to work is Jesus Christ. If he is the cornerstone of your marriage, your marriage is going to work. If he's the cornerstone of your life, your life's going to work. All we got to do is we always got to build according to that cornerstone. And the Lord says, love your enemies. Husbands, love your wife. As Christ loved the church. Wives, submit yourself to your, your husband. So now you're putting everything in, you, in relation to that cornerstone and everything's going to turn out good that, to that building if it's built. And that's what he's saying. And that's how the church is built. You have the church. It's built a certain way where Jesus Christ, he is the cornerstone. He is the foundational stone. He is the cornerstone. It says, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. And so the church is built. You have the apostles and the prophets and Jesus being the foundational cornerstone. So you have the person that everything's built upon is Jesus Christ. You have the teachings of Christ. And then after Jesus, you have the what? Apostles' doctrine. So the, the people that heard the teachings from Jesus were the apostles. That's the first generation. And the apostles heard it from Jesus, and they wrote Scripture. So you have the Word of God. You have the teachings of Jesus, and the apostles wrote it down. And so you have those that heard from Jesus, or it had to be authorized by an apostle, because we know John Mark wasn't an apostle, but it was authorized, and he wrote on behalf of Peter, right? So you have the Word of God. So now you have the Word of, you have Jesus Christ, the Apostles' Doctrine, then of course the Bible has been written, that was written by the Apostles, or stamped by an Apostle, and they heard the teachings from Jesus, and it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so everything is built upon the Word of God. And so when you build your life, when the church is built, and when everything, whether it's your business or even your extracurricular or your marriage, everything is built upon the Word of God, now you have the right foundation. And if you have the right foundation, then what you're building will stand the test of time. And he says this. I don't know why I had this verse down. I guess I should read it. I don't know. I'm not sure why I put it there, but I'll read it because it's here. Romans 11.25 For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So blindness has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in, and then God is going to switch his focus back on Israel. So that means that he's focusing right now on the church until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in until the church age is completed. And when is it going to be completed? At the rapture, like what we already talked about. I think I was supposed to read that, then ask you that. Then you was going to say rapture. Then I was going to say correct. Then I was going to go to the next point. Anyway, as we looked at Ephesians chapter 2, we see the predicament we are in, dead in trespasses and sins, we see the provision as he provided for us because he is rich. God is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. And then we see the position that we're in, positional sanctification. And it's such a blessing. He has created us to do good works. And we should be willing to do them and thankful because of our past, what he delivered us from, what we have now. And he has given us peace. He's, and now we are citizens and we can build upon him who is the chief cornerstone, and base our life upon the Word of God. First thing is to make sure that you are a believer. Have you trusted Christ? You have been listening to our Truth to Live By podcast, a ministry of Windward Baptist Church. 
This podcast is supported by the gifts and donations of its listeners. You can make a secure donation through our website at windwardbaptist.org.